How about this for a record? A 43-year history, 22 albums, 17 Grammy nominations, and two Grammy Awards. Well, one of the members of the group that has this record is my guest. He's Russell Ferrante, and of course, it's the Yellow Jackets. The group will be performing in Myron's at the Smith Center this Saturday, April 20th at 6 and 8.30, so two shows. For ticket information, go to thesmithcenter.com. And for everything about the Yellow Jackets, go to yellowjackets.com. And Russell, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ira. Good to be here. Pleasure. How did you get started with music to begin with? I know there's a long history with the group, but just you personally, how did you get involved with music and in specifically the piano? Right. Well, my father uh, was active in church music. He, he was the choir director uh, growing up. And my mom uh, had also been a musician. She played violin and some piano. But my dad, uh, my dad's work with the church was really the impetus. He um, thought one day maybe I could be the choir accompanist and uh, gave me uh, piano lessons. And also my sister, who actually is a, a music minister in the Bay Area. So she, she kind of fulfilled the family uh, aspirations. I went a slightly <laughs> different direction. So it, it took the pressure off of you a little bit, right? Yeah, actually, I, I, I think that's true. Yeah. So you started getting taught piano, but then you decided to make that choice of going and playing professionally. So before the start of the group, and we can talk about how all that started with, I believe Robin Ford was the instigator for the initial part of the group. But even before then, what path did you take to decide to go down that road of professional musicianship? Yeah, well, I actually, as a youth, I mean, I was taking lessons from about the age of nine. And then I think I stopped taking lessons around maybe late teens. But then um, a friend in high school introduced me to jazz, he was a drummer, and we got together at his house and started playing. And I was, I was just, uh, you know, completely smitten with uh, music and uh, jazz. Um, and I wasn't ready to fully commit at that time because I was really into sports. I played basketball. I had some basketball scholarships to some colleges, and I uh, played one year at San Jose State University, and. Then I realized these guys are really big. I'm not <laughs> quite as big. And um, the jazz band met at the same time as uh, basketball practice. And so <laughs> second year, I, I, I made the decision, I, let me just pursue music. And so I, uh, that was in San Jose. I, I played uh, a lot of, with a lot of different musicians in the San Francisco Bay Area and lived in San Francisco for two years before moving down to Los Angeles. And that was 1977, I believe. And you mentioned Robin Ford, and mm -hmm. I knew Robin from the Bay Area, and I actually started playing with him uh, when I was 21 years old. Uh, he was working with the blues singer Jimmy Witherspoon, and I, that was my really first professional touring music job. And that was with Robin's band backing. He was known as Spoon. <laughs> so yeah. then the, you get together with Robin and the guys and you start playing. And it becomes, of course, the group that has been around for quite a while at this point. Yeah, yeah it's really, I mean, yeah, looking back, it's it's difficult to grasp all of that. I mean... From our perspective, we're just, we're making music, we're trying to learn more, write, uh, meet the obligations that come with having a band, and here we are four decades plus uh, on. So it's, you know, I have to say, it's really, um, I am more aware of how fortunate I am to be able to do this. It, it's a serious gratitude check, you know, that you can make your living uh, doing something you love to do. And, and, and it's still really challenging and great fun. I, I can't imagine not doing it. You seem very relaxed, too. So that obviously, you've come to that appreciation point in your life where, as you say, all these decades 
later, yeah. still getting to do what you love to do. Right. You know, I was hesitant about how to describe the band initially because I've heard it described a couple of different ways. And you at least opened the door by saying how you fell in love with jazz. And I've heard Yellow Jackets connected with fusion jazz or jazz fusion and other other types of descriptions. What would, from your point of view, how would you describe the band? Yeah, well, I, I think if you consider fusion, um, you know, a melding of different influences, it's certainly that, which are really all music, you know, borrows from different th things. I mean, jazz uh, takes inspiration from the blues and, you know, European music, classical music. So, um, but I would, I would say at the heart of what we do is a, a, the ensemble aspect and really trying to improvise, like group improvisation. Um, every set, we pick a different uh, group of songs to play. We don't have like a set um, repertoire every night. You know, we'll, we'll kind of decide before we play what songs we'll play. Sometimes they're, they're songs we maybe haven't played in a while, but just to challenge ourselves. And we really strive to be in the moment and make that performance something, you know, special and authentic, you know, happening in this moment at this time. So um, that means a lot of listening. It's very conversational music. You know, we're, we're listening to one another and we're, we're also feeling the audience and, you know, what kind of feedback are we getting from the people that are listening, you know, what are they responding to? Uh, so, um, yeah, it's this very organic <laughs> experience. And uh, yeah, that's how I would describe it. And it's it's our original music. We write all our own songs, but uh, there's, there's a certain kind of st structures and sound to the band. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just the combination of Th th these four particular musicians. And I want to mention two of the others, Bob Mincer, who's on Woodwinds, mm -hmm. uh, Will Kennedy on drums, uh, right. Dane Alderson on bass. That's correct. And yes. I always like to recognize all the members of the band, even if I'm oh, not yeah. talking with them. So that yeah. the one thing you mentioned something I want to go back to for a second, the original music. And it's true because I looked at your albums going all the way back. And with the exception of that Christmas album or the holiday album, mm -hmm. pretty much it's it's not your standard jazz music that borrows from the Great American Songbook or from other popular songs. It's a much more of an original presentation. Yes, that's true. Uh, and, you know, I love uh, standards in the Great American Songbook. And that's, you know, maybe for jazz musicians, that is like learning Bach and Chopin for a classical musician. That's really the jumping off point. Uh, those chord structures and melodies and the forms of those songs are, are what informs really everything that came after it. So um, we're familiar with that music and you know we'll all play other little gigs around town or different things where we're playing uh, you know, I'll, as a sideman, I might play that music, but um, with Yellow Jackets, um, we part of really the joy is writing and composing our own music and mm -hmm. recording it, and uh, so that's what we, we present. I want to mention your new album, current album, is Parallel Motion, Correct. And, um, yeah. and that's available if you go to the website again is yellowjackets.com and you can get all the information uh from the website as well as all a bunch of stuff on the band itself and the history and everything else it's, so it's a fascinating story there when you look at the evolution of the group because you started out originally uh with Jimmy Haslip and Ricky Lawson and you mentioned Robin Ford etc so over time, the group evolved, members, new members came into the band. You're the sort of what I call the torchbearer or the culture setter for the band. Was it easy, hard, challenging, uh, whatever the word would be to 
I'm going to use this word in a positive way, indoctrinate the new members of the band into what you wanted. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, well, first I'll say that the band, there it's leaderless. There is no leader in Yellow Jackets. So each of the four musicians has equal say in what happens. So as you would imagine, changing one musician uh, is going to impact the whole thing. It's going to change the sound. And we've tried to be really, you know, I mean, careful in the people that we've associated with and, and you know, chosen to be in the band. I mean, they're, they're people that are like-minded, you know, have similar musical uh, experience and taste. But we don't really tell like a new person that joins the band. The, the latest one was Dane Alderson. He's um, like the, the age of our children now. <laughs> My daughter's older than Dane. And, <laughs> and so when he joined the band, we gave him a, a group of songs to learn, but we didn't tell him what to play. We really want the input from every musician. We want each person to play what's comfortable for them. And of course, it's got to fit with the band. And there's a certain sound that's been established. But there's a lot of freedom within that. And we encourage the, a new member to bring themselves you know, to the party, so to speak. Um, so it's, it sounds like it's a combination of what I used earlier, indoctrination in a positive way, but also respect for yeah, the member. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a better way of saying it. Yeah, we we have mutual respect, and um, it's just understood that each guy is going to um, make the music his own. And if you respect the music, that tells you what to play. And the musicians you're playing with, th th that's going to really be your... Um, kind of guide for for mm -hmm. what to do so uh, if you find the right guys it's really a joy and uh so bob has been with the band since 1990 so that's verging on 34 years will began playing drums with us in 86 and then he took a 10-year hiatus <laughs> and returned in 2010 so he's been playing the music for a long time. I've been in the band since it started, and I just mentioned Dane nine years. So there's a lot of longevity, you know, represented in the current lineup. When you look at the people that come to your performances, do you find that, and I've asked this question of others who have had a, a long career in music, and usually with the same band, do you find that your audience brings, for example, their sons and daughters or their grandsons and daughters to see you so they get an introduction to what you do yes we've 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 seen that a lot um you know after the shows if if uh we're selling cds or meeting and greeting people which we love to do and which we will be doing at the smith center um we hear all kinds of stories yeah and and a lot of younger musicians and younger fans whose parents have turned them on to the band. That's, that's really, um, it's very gratifying. A really funny thing that happens too, you know, people will bring in some of the older uh, LPs or CDs and these photos were full head of hair. <laughs> you know, earlier, I, I completely like, is that you? <laughs> well, what's great about that though, if you think about it, again, going back to gratitude is that there are you may have less hair, but your musicianship is still great. And you can get, and you're, as you said earlier, you, you like to learn and you like to grow. So you're still developing. And so you have that great opportunity. A lot of people don't. Some people that work in jobs and they reach a certain point and they can't, they can't continue for whatever reason. So you're, you're in a whole different world. Yeah, I mean, that's w one of the great joys of doing this. And also, <laughs> a great uh, humbler because you, you know the the more you understand and strive to to know 
the, the more aware you are of how much you don't know. And um, so that's, um, yeah. But you, I guess you have to come to terms with that, you know, a certain level of acceptance, maybe. Not, not that you're giving in, that you'll never reach those heights, <laughs> but that uh, you have a realistic expectation for yourself. And, you know, not musicians are notoriously really self-critical and really hard on themselves. And I guess, you know, people in all different areas, but... Um, that that's not as bothersome these days, you know, kind of, again, maybe with age or whatever you comes wisdom. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. We mentioned that you're going to be at Myron's at the Smith Center Saturday, April 20th at six and eight thirty. So there's two shows. And right. you mentioned earlier also that you change it up. With the shows, you don't do the yeah. same, which is a right. great way to do it. It keeps you fresh. Yes, and, and in between, you're going to be meeting the the uh, audience members afterwards to uh, say hello and uh, sign CDs and sell CDs and etc. Do you find that there's a common question that comes up to the group from the audience after the show? Is there one or two things that you're surprised that the question comes up, but it does come up? And I don't know what that would be. That's why I'm asking you the question. I would say the most common question and it's a good one and it's our most dreaded question <laughs> how did the band get its name <laughs> and, so, so we, that's better than where did the hair go yeah right right, <laughs> right yeah um so that's one and another one from um yeah we also do a lot of workshops and uh sort of educational things and until about a year ago, three of us were teaching at University of Southern California. Uh, I retired last year, but Will Kennedy and Bob Mintz are still teach there. So we're, we, we work with a lot of young musicians. And one of the questions that comes from uh, young players is they're curious about how we create the music, how we write the music and kind of uh, organize it and work it up to record, you know, whether it's, you know, one guy kind of dictating things, or as I mentioned before, that's not really the case. It's a very collaborative mm -hmm. process. And also uh, the question, where, where do your ideas come from? You know, like, where does a song come from? And so... Uh, you know, what's uh, intriguing about what you're talking about is in our society, particularly our society, not other cultures, but in our society, People who are older don't necessarily get respect from those who are younger because people who are younger seem to think they know it all. And <laughs> in, the, in the world that you're describing at USC, in the in the world of music in general, the fact that younger musicians, students, and uh, others can realize that there's so much that they can learn from someone who has that experience and asking those questions, of where does the song come from, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, I think truth most of the time you do <laughs> i do yeah sometimes you don't get through to all the young well yes, right but yeah in general and and when i was young i mean i was looking up to the people who were older than me and had recorded and toured and had experience doing what i wanted to do so um yeah i think it's it's natural and it's probably smart to really try to learn from those who have walked ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned. Uh, and I have just the utmost respect for, you know, the, the musicians that I learned from. I mean, it's really like a shared, it's a shared um, process or, sh or shared experience. I think it's a shared universe in that world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you, you were growing up and you started to study and learn the piano, did you have any, and I'll combine it, it's just a separate question, but I'm going to find, combine it. Were there, did you have any mentors and or idols that you looked up to? You mentioned obviously looking at some of the people who had recorded and toured. Yeah. Were there very, some specific people that really affected how you approach the world of jazz and the world of the piano? Yeah, there there were. Um, 
probably the least known of those people would be a musician in San Jose who he passed maybe two or three years ago. His name was Clifford Coulter. And he was an incredible organist, pianist, singer, uh, just an amazing musician. And he kind of just stayed in the Bay Area. I mean, a few people outside of the Bay Area knew about him, but he was an incredible inspiration, um, kind of leg legendary to all this, mm -hmm. the South Bay musicians. So Clifford was the first guy who really inspired me. And then, um, of the well-known jazz musicians, you know, the pianists like Herbie Hancock, McCoy Tyner, um, Keith Jarrett, uh, Chick Corea, uh, and horn players John Coltrane and Miles Davis and all the people that move, you know, went through their bands. Um, Wayne Shorter, the great inspiration, incredible composer. And then I was also listening to other kinds of music, like I, I enjoyed enjoy and I'm in awe of the great classical composers, you know, uh, Mahler and Stravinsky and, you know, the list goes on and on. And then like, uh, I love Brazilian music and Jobim, Antonio Carlos Jobim, the great Brazilian composer, those beautiful melodies and elegant harmonies. Uh, those, those people I mentioned are particularly inspiring to me. Yeah. When people listen to music, I'll just make it personal. When I listen to music, the right kind of music for me, it does transport me. It does take me to another place. Uh, and usually it's a happy place, unless I want to be depressed, which I don't want to be. <laughs> but how does that work for you on stage when you're performing music with the group? Are you also transported to another place? Are, is yes. it different zone? We really kind of enter into this kind of world where time stops. I mean, you're, you're just in, in a kind of flow. And I mean, I wish we could get there every moment of every performance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, there are challenges, like maybe the, the piano that I'm playing on that particular night is not, it's not giving me back very much, you know, uh, or, or maybe the sound is a little funny. But when when all the elements are in place and you can hear clearly and it's a good sounding room i mean yeah you you really go to another place and short of that i mean the goal is to always transcend whatever obstacles are in your way so we try to let the music just carry us you know uh, carry us away and hoping that and I think it's true, the audience senses that as well. They really can pick up when things are connected and um, or there's a, a moment like a, a surprise or a spark that happens, you know, an unexpected moment. I, I, I hear the audience respond to that. It's really amazing. There's, we're kind of all on the same wavelength. Because so. you have to be in tune with the other three as well as the audience. Yes, I mean, it, it's, it starts with the music and the other musicians on stage. And then we try to make uh, the band sound like one thing. It's, you're not hearing separate, you know, I guess you could if you wanted, but the goal is to make it a cohesive whole that communicates a certain energy and uh, intensity. Mm -hmm. Beauty, yeah. So that's that's always the goal. Do you get the same feeling when you are recording as opposed to performing live that you hit that zone and the all four of you are in that moment and it becomes effortless or is recording more of a, not drudgery because you want to get it as good as you can get it because it's going to be permanent. Yes, um, it's a little different dynamic. I, the The aspect of connecting with the other band members is still there. I mean, that's always the goal, and um, and we can do that in a recording studio. But you're you're missing the input from an audience, the excitement that you know performing in front of people um, can provide. Um, 
and then in the studio because you, like you mentioned it's it's not just going to be played and then gone into the ether it's something that's going to be heard repeatedly i think we're all a little more um you know uh critical of what we're doing and we really we we try to we don't want mistakes we don't want errors and so maybe um sometimes you're thinking to, you're thinking too much sometimes that's the biggest obstacle um in recording is not you know not just overthinking and letting the music flow and entering into the moment mm -hmm. and that can be a little more challenging in a recording studio which is more like a laboratory you know well also too you have to realize that your kids are going to hear it when you're long gone and your grandkids and your great grandkids so you want to you want to have it as as perfect as it can be yeah 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 and yeah and it's a balance between you know really ha having everything you know so called perfect but then right you want you want the soul and the you know the humanity too you don't want to squeeze that out of it for perfect perfection good point before i let you go who's the most important person you met in your career so far could be in the world of jazz or in the general world of music that mm. had an influence on you not necessarily when you were growing up personally but professionally and then you got to meet them hmm well there's there's a couple people a couple icons that i had an opportunity to work with and um they they were both i mean i mentioned wayne shorter before i had the opportunity to to play in his band for a short time and to rehearse at his house and he he was one of my heroes and um my association with him only you know confirm that he was an incredible human being really unique thinker so he would be one and then i had the the opportunity to tour for one year with joni mitchell and um i have the utmost respect for her she truly an artist uh, someone who you could tell she's always observing she's always paying attention you know, tuned into what's going on around her. And uh, that was a great lesson, just to see how tuned in she was. So those two people. And then um, another person who I, the Yellow Jackets has gotten a chance to make music with and is an amazing guy is Bobby McFerrin. Are you familiar with him? A little bit. Yeah, I, well, incredible singer and a creative force so those those three i think uh they're kind of on my mount rushmore <laughs> well that's a great way to leave it my guest has been russell ferrante of the yellow jackets and they're going to be performing in myron's at the smith center this saturday april 20th at 6 and 8 30 so there's two shows for taking information go to the smithcenter.com for everything about the Yellow Jackets, go to yellowjackets.com. And Russell, thanks for being on the show. It was a real pleasure, Ira. Thank you. Thanks. See you next time.